patient who's on blood thinners for cardiac issues, they have to resume their blood thinners, but they were found to have a large amount of bleeding in their left abdominal wall with active bleeding seen on a CAT scan illustrated here. They need to resume their blood thinner, which has been held temporarily, and so we will be performing a transcatheter embolization of the arteries leading to this bleed. So our catheter is placed into the left inferior gastric artery, and as the contrast gets injected, we can see areas where there's active contrast extravasation in more than one and these are corresponding to the findings that are in the CAT scan, and those are the locations that will be embolized in front. And this is after embolization of the same artery, and this contrast is being injected, and what we see is the absence of the bleeding artery and the absence of any further extravasation, so this is successful embolization. This is the pelvic MRI of a 43-year-old female who has symptomatic uterine fibroids. As we scroll down, you can see that this is the uterus. It's very enlarged and abnormal appearing. There are several masses. She has a dominant fibroid here on the right. She has a few smaller ones on the left, as well as multiple tiny ones sort of throughout the rest of her uterus. This is the T2. And on the post-contrast, you can see that they all enhance, meaning that they are viable. The large one here on the right has homogeneous enhancement. The largest one on the left also enhances. Sort of the smaller one at the fundus enhances peripherally, but is centrally necrotic. Uh, but given that the majority of her fibroids enhance and are viable, I think that she would be a good candidate for fibroid embolization. Here we're in the left uterine artery uh, coming from above via a transradial approach. This is a five French vert catheter. This is a DSA of the left uterine artery. You can see that the artery is very hypertrophied. It's got a lot of little hypertrophied branches supplying a large fibroid uterus. Usually these branches are much smaller and the blush is not as extensive as this. So here we're in the left uterine artery with several hypertrophied branches. We're now in the horizontal portion of the uterine artery, the left uterine artery. It went a little bit more distal than the prior run. This way we have more room for reflux and I'm embolizing with particles, specifically 500 to 700 micron particles. We usually start with those before we move on to bigger particles. And you can see here that the flow is beginning to slow down. You don't see as much of the more distal hypertrophy branches anymore. So this is after embolization. We can see that the flow is very slowed down. Uh, you don't see the hypertrophied branches in the distal portion anymore. And it's important to note that the cervical vaginal branch going more inferiorly is still patent. That's uh, something that you want to keep patent so that the patient doesn't experience uh, unwanted symptoms of pain, uh, bleeding down there, while the hypertrophy branches supplying the fibroids uh, seem to be in complete stasis. This is us doing the same thing on the other side, on the right side now. Again, you see a very tortuous, hypertrophied right uterine artery supplying some fibroids. Less fibroid blush this time because the majority of the supply came in this particular woman from the left side, which we embolized first. And we're doing the same thing, again, using particles, getting good distal penetration with the 500 to 700 micron particles until we see stasis. So this is the case of a 51 year old male who has a history of alcoholic liver cirrhosis, uh, found to be hypotensive and tachycardic, passing uh, both melanin and bright red blood per rectum. He was scoped by the gastroenterology team. He was found to have a large bleeding gastric ulcer, which they tried to control endoscopically, but were unsuccessful. So they called us to see if we could offer any endovascular treatment options. So the first thing we do for these cases is usually get a CTA to see if there's any extravasation on the arterial phase study. Uh, and on this guy, this is an arterial phase exam. It's subtle because he has a lot of blood products in his uh, 
gastric lumen, but there is some travisation of contrast here. You can see it's a little bit more hyper dense than the remaining products in the stomach. And we know that because on the non-contrast phase here in the same region, uh, we do not see that. So it must be extravasated contrast. So after the CTA, we brought him into the IR suite, start with a celiac artery run. And here you can see conventional celiac anatomy with the splenic artery coursing to the left, the left gastric artery coursing cranially, and the uh, common hepatic artery coursing towards the liver to the right. This is a super selective angiogram. My microcatheter is in the left gastric artery. And on this run, you can see that there is an area of extravasation near the cardia of the stomach, which correlates with what we saw on CTA, so not an unsurprising finding. And this obviously correlates with uh, arterial hemorrhage. This is a zoomed in closer view of the area of concern. So you can again see the extravasation here. It's subtle because uh, the guy is very large, so the images are not very clear, but there is the area of extravasation. So this is the embolization run. You can see that my catheter, my microcatheter is still on the left gastric artery, and you can see the glue particles moving forward. I decided to embolize with glue because the patient is coagulopathic due to his liver disease, and the embolic glue does not depend on the coagulation cascade to work, uh, like coils and other embolics do. So I decided to go with glue. And again, you can see the glue. It's mixed with papyrol to make it radio opaque. And you can see it's going towards where it needs to go. This is the post embolization run. And as you can see, it's through our base catheter, which is parked in the proximal left gastric artery. You can see our glue cast over here, spreading out into the distal branches of the left gastric. And as you can see, we have complete stasis. The area of extravasation seen on the prior runs is no longer visualized. The more distal branches are all in complete stasis. So about 24 hours after the procedure, the patient is still in the ICU, but is doing clinically much better. He went from two presser requirements down to one presser requirement, as well as uh, cessation of his melana and his bright red blood per rectum. No more blood in the rectal tube and uh, no more new blood coming out of his uh, NG tube either. So we're hopeful that he'll do well over the next 24 hours or so.